Patrick Templeman and Bull and Jeremy. Take it away. Thank you, and uh, uh, thank you for coming out on this wet day. Um, just to start, uh, we had the idea to, for this seminar. It, it grew out of an experience that I had with a friend of mine who was an established uh, touring musician. Uh, and they found themselves in a position where they could no longer afford their rent, right? So the person had been touring professionally for nearly 30 years, living in New Orleans um, at a pre-Katrina rent. And of course, that's harder and harder to, to find. Uh, they came back from a tour, had lost their rent, and were attempting to buy a house and discovered and, and came to me for help because they didn't have the wherewithal or the understanding of their situation and couldn't figure out why they were in the position they were in. Now, um, in my life, I've been a lot luckier than that and uh, have uh, training in business and in finance. And because I live in New Orleans, I felt like I wanted to put together, I wanted to help musicians um, uh, so that as their career grows, they are not in that same kind of position. So they always have room for rent, they always have money for rent, they always have money to make music, they always have money to do their art. Uh, I, not being a professional musician or in the service business to the music industry, I reached out to friends of mine, uh, Patrick Templeman, who is a professional business manager for musicians based here in New Orleans with clients worldwide, and Tim Kappel, who is a legal professional with, also with uh, uh, clients worldwide uh, and a lot of clients in New Orleans. And we got together and we said, what could we, what do we know as old professionals that might be of use to young musicians starting out in their career such that when they get to be our age, they're in a more uh, 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 standardized, a, a more firm position. And so that's, that's the genesis of this meeting. And so we'll have a, some comments and some slides, and then we'll ask for questions at the end. And uh, also, no, this, this is an experiment. If, uh, if the content is useful and helpful, we'll expand it. We'll do it again uh, down the road, it, perhaps with uh, more detail in, in certain topics. And so um, we want to start with all of the financial flows in the music business, right? Because sometimes people think about the revenue coming to them without the costs required to build that revenue flow. And we brainstormed all these, uh, um, so you can see uh, Schroeder here, our, our friendly Schroeder musician, um, clip art. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the various kind, so some of you may be familiar with some of these uh, fl cash flows already, but we needed an organizing principle for the day, and we wanted to make sure we pointed out all the things that you have to worry about as a musician, right? You go to school to become a musician, you, you, learn, you, you learn your craft, you learn your trade, no one ever teaches you the business part of how to, you, you know, being a musician is also being a business, it's being an entrepreneur, and no one ever teaches you the business part of the being a musician. And so that's what we hope to do here today. And so this is the, the it's sort of a summary of the cash flows of the music, of a music entrepreneur, right? There's income streams from touring and from merchandise, which um, uh, Tim will talk about. There's uh, income from recorded music, which Tim will talk about. There's publishing income. Meanwhile, there's all of these other uh, expenses that go to supporting that. And so we want to talk about how to manage them how to plan for them, and how to ensure that, they, um, that, you, that uh, you can cover them as they become required. So, um, sure. Um, I'll, t I'll take this one. Uh, so as, as Jeremy said, I'm a business manager. I, I have clients um, here in New Orleans and all over the world that are musicians. And, and uh, as the business has changed over the years, especially in the last, the last number of years, touring has become one of the most important pieces of, that, of, that, of the business that they have. So I figured what we would talk a little bit about, I think this is relevant for international touring musicians and for anybody who's a, making a living as a musician, 
I wanted to talk a little bit about touring revenue and, and how to calculate that. So I put together some budgets and I think Jeremy kind of condensed it down a little bit. But we started off with uh, the, the person busking on the street who makes zero to $250 of performance and the expenses that they've got range between 10 to $50, might be a Uber ride or, or whatever. And, and uh, so their, their net can be anywhere from negative 50 to $200. <clears throat> and then we, I cut, put together a basic budget for a in-town solo performance um, where the gross of the show is $2,000, commissions to their manager, their agent, um, and any other professionals that they may, ha may have are $600. Expenses to, pay, to, you know, to get there, or maybe to travel or to stay somewhere at night is uh, 100 to $200, so a net of 1200 to $1,400. Um, and then on, the, on this side, uh, a tour, whether it's a, a band tour or a solo tour, and I think you can see that a lot of times, if you're making around the same amount of money, it makes a lot more sense to tour solo. Um, but, but uh, you know, sometimes that's not what the performance is. So a lot of people go out and, and tour with the band, and, and a lot of times that can turn into a lot more income, which, which, which makes it worthwhile. But a lot of times my clients look at me and say, well, wait a minute, I did this tour, I grossed $28,000, and I came home with $800. And, we go through the expenses and, the, and it, it all adds up. Um, so sometimes they might have to tour solo too. Um, so anyway, that's, that's an illustration about some, some touring revenue budgets. And I think, like I said, that's relevant to, to everybody. Any, any musician out there should be thinking about these numbers. You want to talk a little bit about what the expenses are? Since <coughs> I've condensed them so much. What's that? You want to talk about what the expenses are a little bit since I've condensed them so much? Um, yeah, we can. Um, the, with the band tour, some of the expenses that you might be talking about are paying your band, uh, hotel, airfare. Um, you might have a bus if you're, if you're riding in a tour bus. Um, with the solo tour, you're, you've got a lot of the same expenses, just less people. So less hotels, less airfares, less people to pay. So one of the reasons that, that touring revenue has become so important is that over the past uh, 16 years or uh, 17 years, the, uh, the ability to monetize recorded music has, has almost you know, all but evaporated. Um, that, is, that is something that we should all be very concerned about. Uh, the, the inability to have you know, uh, recorded music generate revenue but it is a fact uh, the, where uh, consumers are right now and the way that they have chosen to consume music is not a, a it, it is very difficult to monetize that. No, that's better. Right. So um, when we talk about the uh, recorded music, I'm, I'm distinguishing between publishing revenue, right? So that there's, there's the ability to make money on songs and there's the ability to make money on the sound recording. So when we talk about recorded music, um, we talk about sales of physical goods, digital downloads, ringtones, and on-demand streaming. Those are probably the, the, the main ones. On-demand streaming is by far the um, um, consumption model of choice at the moment. And so we've really got to figure out how, uh, uh, how to make that beneficial. So if we go to the next slide, I want to just kind of show you um, this is a chart that was put together uh, to try and give you an idea about what the per stream rates are and how many streams it would take in order to make a minimum wage salary. So as you can see, um, Tidal or Napster is, is up there at the, at the top. Tidal gets a lot of credit for being you know, more artist friendly and I think in a sense, that's deserved because, uh, as you can see, they're, they're higher than most. Uh, way down at the bottom is, uh, is YouTube. And unfortunately, uh, YouTube streams are worldwide, are, primar are the primary means that people are consuming music. So the, the most used service pays the least. That's sort of a problem. 
the reason that they pay the least has to do with some legal, uh, has, is a legal issue, and it's um, because they have what's called a DMCA safe harbor. They are immune from uh, secondary copyright infringement liability, which means that when they go to negotiate these deals, uh, they are able to use that shield, that liability shield, to push down the rates because it's essentially a take it or leave it offer, right? If Spotify goes to the, a major record company and says, this is what I would like to license your catalog and the, and the record company doesn't like the, the offer, they say, well, no, thank you. That's not really a possibility with YouTube because if you say no, thank you, it doesn't mean your, your music's going to be up there anyway, right? Because it's going to be user generated content as opposed to licensed content. And so, uh, there is an incentive uh, from rec you know, record companies and you as recorded music rights holders to get the best deal you can get, you know, take, what, take what you can get. And so that's something that I think we need legislation, we need the law to change. Uh, hopefully some of you heard about the Music Modernization Act. The, the, it's a huge change in, in U.S. copyright law uh, around music that was pushed through this year. Um, this is one of the next battlefronts, right? So it didn't accomplish everything that needs to be accomplished. Um, and so this is one of the things that would be on the next battlefront. So if we go back to the, as you can see, the bottom line there is it's, it would take one hell of a lot of streams uh, to really turn revenue. Yeah. Can I ask an, sure. Can I ask a nerdy question? Go ahead. So on the YouTube per stream revenue, that does not include um, commissions for ads that YouTube might put up against your video? No, that's generally, that is generated through ads. Oh, so this is, all right, so they're not paying like a per play royalty like Spotify would. No. Th that's what, that's the ad revenue? They do a revenue split. They do a revenue share. Hmm. Right. Wow. Yeah. Sweet deal, right? <laughs> uh, it's for them. And, you know, they've, they've built, this service has been built on the, on the backs of content creators. And, in my humble opinion, I think it's high time that they start paying their fair share. Um, we, but even with legitimate service, uh, that's not fair, uh, even with uh, uh, services that, that are, uh, aren't able to negotiate with the DMCA, their DMCA protection in the background, like Spotify, like Tidal, uh, there's still some real problems in that, you know, your streams uh, it takes about a thousand streams to, to reach the equivalent of what you might have received from a digital download just 10 years ago. That's a problem, right? That, that is a real problem. Uh, this, I, I remember when uh, I was getting into the business, they had this concept of, um, uh, you know, a hundred, what, a thousand dedicated fans. You know, if you can just really go out and capture a thousand people who are dedicated fans, that can fund your music career because they, are, uh, their dedication and their dollars can carry you forward through uh, purchasing your music and through m purchasing your merchandise. Well, if you get a thousand fans at this point and they go stream your song 5,000 times, that's not, or, or you know, they stream your song five times each, that's not gonna amount to much at all, right? And that's, that's just a, a, a huge breakdown in the ability uh, in, in our industry and it's something that we need to fix. Uh, one way that we could fix it, and this is, uh, I don't wanna get into it too deeply, but um, you all uh, probably don't, or maybe you do recognize that when somebody stream, if I stream your song, my money that I pay to Spotify, my, my 10 bucks, doesn't go to the artist that I stream, right? Everybody's money gets pulled together into a big pot, and then all the streams get pulled together in a big pot, and then they split it up pro rata. That sounds kind of fair until you think about it. It's like, well, wait a minute. When I walk into a record store and I purchase a record, I don't, sh you know, that money goes to the rights holder. It's not shared with everybody that sold a record in that store. And so what ends up happening is independent artists and artists who uh, don't have, you know, millions and millions of streams, they get diluted in the royalty pool. And so they end up seeing far, far less. So one of the changes, and this is not something that would happen through legislation, it just needs to happen from the independent artist community standing up and saying no more, would be to say is what's called a user-centric payment model. So that my money goes to the people that I listen to on Spotify. And that could overnight change the way that independent artists make money through streaming. You could see streaming 
rates that are as high as five cents a stream, right? Compare that to around half a penny a stream. That that could really, really be a game changer. And so it's something you all should really be aware of. It's called a user-centric payment model, and it's something that we all need to be arguing for. Anyway, um, so back to the, the, the previous slide. Uh, the, one of the next uh, battles also is around public performance of sound recordings. Right? There's still no general public performance right for sound recordings, meaning that when a song gets played on the radio, the composers get paid, but the, the recording artists don't get paid. And that is one of the next um, uh, legislative changes that we will be seeking, is to have a performance right in sound recordings so that that becomes a revenue stream that recording artists can benefit from. Currently, what you have is a digital public performance royalty, and that's uh, payments. So if your song gets digitally publicly performed through, say, Pandora, or say through Sirius XM satellite radio, you do generate royalties. And those royalties can actually be very good money. Um, uh, and so it, it is something that, that you should definitely consider uh, having, making sure that you are properly registered with who? Who, col who collects digital public performance royalties? Sound exchange. Sound exchange. They are the exclusive and the sole uh, public performance organization, public performance society for sound recordings and for recording artists. So ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, that's all for composers. That's all for songwriters. And if you're a songwriter, you should be registered with them too. But you have to be registered with Sound Exchange in order to get those, those, that revenue that's generated through uh, plays on Pandora and SiriusXM. Um, the, the last two uh, we can talk about, I can talk about a little bit uh, more when we talk about the composition revenue. The point with when we talk about synchronizations and syncs, the, 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 the reason that I have it under recorded music revenue is that, remember, you have to license both sides, right? You have to license the song and you have to license the recording when you sync, when you use a, a piece of music in a film, in a television commercial, what have you, or on, a, on online video for that matter. So you have to license both sides and generally those sides split 50-50. So if a sync pays $10,000, the sound recording rights holder should get $5,000. And the, and the publishing owner should get 5000 So it's significant revenue. Go to the next slide. Um, when we talk about publishing revenue, uh, syncs, we just talked about uh, that, right? So if you can get your, your music placed in some sort of audiovisual medium, that generates significant, can you know, generate revenue anywhere from in the hundreds of dollars um, uh, all the way, you know, up to, you know, half a million and beyond. If you're talking about a major motion picture and a huge song, you can talk about in the millions. But generally, for my clients, I've found that the range is somewhere between, you know, uh, maybe say like $1,000 if somebody wants to, to run an, like an online-only uh, uh, campaign for a, a few weeks or a month. Um, up to around thirty or forty thousand dollars if you get your your song in a in a motion picture, um, and that's just sort of reflective of where my clients are at. But obviously, the bigger the artist, the bigger the payouts. Um, apart from sync royalty, uh, uh, sync payments, you have mechanical royalties. Mechanical royalties are generated every time uh, the song is reproduced as a part of the sound recording. So you embed that song as a part of a, the sound recording, and when that sound recording gets reproduced and distributed, that generates mechanical royalties. Um, the way to think about that is the, the reason it's called mechanical royalties is because it comes from the term mechanical reproduction. And the, the mechanical reproduction royalties, uh, the first kind of mechanical reproduction royalty came from piano rolls. So it was not a reproduction uh, like a print reproduction, it was a reproduction, a mechanical reproduction in the form of a piano roll. So uh, now that takes the, the form of physical goods, digital downloads, ring to, uh, ringtones, and on-demand streaming. The problem with uh, uh, mechanical royalties used to be a significant source of revenue for songwriters when you talk about physical goods and even digital downloads. But just as we saw, uh, as physical goods and digital downloads have, have become less and less of the, the way that we consume music, 
these mechanical royalty rates for on-demand streaming are just in the toilet because it's based on a percentage of revenue. There is no, it's not what's called a penny rate. A penny rate would mean, hey, every time this thing gets reproduced, I know exactly how much is gonna, I'm gonna get paid. So when somebody uh, d downloads your, uh, uh, your song, you're gonna get 9.1 cents every time. You know exactly what you're gonna get paid. But for uh, uh, mechanical royalties for on-demand streaming, it is uh, based on a percentage of revenue. And it's, as you can see, it's, it's, it's a pittance. Now, this is one of the major things that the, that the Music Modernization Act will hopefully change. But as of right now, it, the, the rates are still very low. But after the Music Modernization Act gets implemented, it's been passed, but after it gets implemented, these rates should go up. They should go up. Uh, and then the, one of the, the, big, the, the, the biggest money in, um, in songwriting uh, remains in radio. And radio, uh, you know, if you get a number one song uh, at pop or country radio, you're, you know, you can be looking at over a million dollars. Um, and so it's a significant amount of, of revenue. Of course, if you are, um, you know, only being played through like a local, not, you know, non-commercial station, radio, or uh, a college radio station, obviously those rates are not going to be uh, as high, right? Because the amount that the radio station pays is based on their on their revenues and non-commercial uh, radio stations don't have the revenue so that's why the the more popular the format the the, the higher the, the revenue is going to be um yeah sure so for the mechanical royalties on on-demand streaming do the streaming services actually separate out artist royalties from publishing royalties, or, or are they actually all jumbled together? Well, that, that was part of the problem that the music modernization, what they, what the, the streaming services, they do split it out. The problem that they say is we don't know who to pay, right? They didn't have any infrastructure to, to, to find the, the proper rights holders, or at least that was their argument. They didn't have a, the proper infrastructure in place to pay th those amounts. So what the Music Modernization Act has done is it is going to create a singular licensing body for on-demand streaming for the collection of mechanical royalties. So it's going to be like an ask. It's going to be like a sound exchange, but for mechanical royalties. And so a uh, a service like Spotify will be able to go get a blanket license. So you don't you won't have to get an individual mechanical license for every song in your catalog. Which, as you know, for Spotify and Apple Music is like, you know, 40 million. So you don't have to get 40 million mechanical licenses anymore. You get one and you pay all the money to this mechanical licensing collective and then they go find the proper person to pay. And SoundExchange, as using SoundExchange as a model, they've been really good about finding the proper payees, tracking down the people, getting them registered. And that's hopefully what will happen with the mechanical licensing collective as well. Um, but again, until we get the rates up, it only matters for the, the upper echelon artists. It doesn't really matter for the independent artists because there's no money being generated anyway. So got to get the rates up and then make sure that the money goes to the right people. Uh, and I think we've already talked about synchronization use, but uh, the, the last one is, is through like secondary sources of income, things like samples, print and lyric reprints, grand rights, or uh, basically if you're licensing your song to be performed in a, as a part of a musical, uh, only applicable to a very small subset of, of songwriters. Um, but keep in mind, sampling, sampling um, I always tell my clients not to sample because uh, particularly for an independent artist, they're shocked to know that to get that sample properly cleared, they're going to have to pay probably five, 10 grand in terms of an advance to, you know, the publisher and the record label. Um, and so if somebody wants to sample your music, you, you, you are, are, you know, you stand to do very well. Um, but it is a, it is kind of expensive to sample. And so I, if you're an independent artist, or I, I always uh, advise against sampling just because the cost of properly clearing it is uh, eye popping to a lot of people.
Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit also about uh, the team, the team around an artist, an artist team of advisors, which to me is, is one of the more important things when, when I consider working with an artist, that's one of the things that I think about first. Um, who else is going to be involved? Do I trust them? Do I trust their uh, professional ability? So <clears throat> some, some of the people involved, the kind of primary person who's there to guide your career is your personal manager. Uh, they're there to help you make decisions about, um, you know, you, you've got the idea of the art, but they're going to help you promote it. They're going to help you put together the plan to, to make it successful. Um, these people kind of, they, they do a lot of babysitting as well. Um, but, they, but, it, but, but overall, they're kind of the, the buck stops with them as far as being the main advisor, I think, to, to their clients about the major decisions in their career. Um, they typically get paid 15 to 20 percent. I also, uh, typically of the gross, there's generally some carve-outs that there might be, uh, sound rentals, light rentals, things like that. And it, it's all negotiable, really, at the end of the day. Pretty much all these roles are negotiable, but industry standard is about that. Um, the other, another important person is your booking agent. Um, this is the person that negotiates your contracts, all of your public performances. Um, that might be a big agency like CAA, and it might be an independent agency, which there's a lot of them all over the country uh, and the world. Um, these guys typically get paid 10% of, 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 the, of the, just, just the stuff that they book, just your public performances. Um, another role is, is Tim here, your attorney. Um, Tim's there to negotiate all of your other contracts, basically. Uh, he may look at some of the performance contracts as well, um, but, but he's looking at your record contracts, he's looking at your publishing contracts, negotiating them, potentially soliciting them. Um, he might be doing employee agreements for all your employees. Um, what, else, what else do you find yourself negotiating? <laughs> well, I mean, it just depends on the, on the client, but I mean, that, if for, if, for instance, some of my clients self-administer their, their publishing. They've been able to, to retain mm -hmm rights in their publishing, perhaps like in an earlier, or, or they have rights in their masters from an earlier catalog that the label doesn't own. And so in that instance, I'll end up find myself doing a lot of the sync licensing and uh, a catalog administration work as well. But yeah, I mean, basically, if we're talking about a, a management deal, publishing deal, uh, record deal, uh, all those things are generally coming through me. I occasionally uh, look at performance agreements, but that's, but that would be if, a, if an artist doesn't have an agent already. Um, uh, but it's pretty rare that I, that I have a client who's got an agent uh, that, that they send me their, their performance agreement. I usually don't see a lot of those. Endorsement deals, sponsorship deals, those sorts of things. Um, so attorneys typically, uh, most of the time I'm seeing 5% of gross revenue. Sometimes it might be a fee. There might be a retainer or something like that um, against the... Against the uh, the hourly fees, um, which is similar to how we get paid as business managers. We typically are either 5% of gross or, um, or we also might be paid by the hour as well or there might be a retainer. At the end of the day, the way I see it is if it's fair for the time that we're putting in uh, versus what we're getting paid, it needs to feel fair to us and it needs to feel fair to our clients. Um, and then a publicist who's, who is the person who's there to, you, you know, to, to work, your, work your record at press, to work your tour at press, to get people uh, to pay attention. Before we move on, given the context that, that Tim laid out of the sort of ever-decreasing revenue stream accruing to, for musical performance, say you're a young musician, you, you, maybe you've uh, used your credit card, you've, you've cut a, an EP. When in, the, when in your career is the right time to start thinking about these kinds of advisors? Yeah, I mean, it's been my experience that in in when it works best, it's it's when the professionals uh, come to you. Um, when you're doing something that is catching people's ears and is is, is has either potential or is on the rise or it's got the, a local buzz, these people will come out of the woodworks to find you, and and that is the best opportunity. I usually caution clients not to go looking for for these services. It, it, it may be a little bit different with a business manager because of, of the role that they play. Um, but 
I think it is different as far as we usually get involved last, probably, maybe the publicist also, but you guys are involved on the front end frequently, yeah. and managers, and then agents, and then when there's enough money for us to be involved, then right. we get involved. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, and another this 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 slide's a little different. We're we're moving around and trying to hit a whole bunch of uh, a bunch of different things that that are relevant here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about tax returns. Um, you know, I, tax returns are uh, some something not to be completely scared of. I think one of the problems that I see, you know, young musicians or musicians who are getting started to make the mistake of is, you know, that they, they don't file tax returns. Um, and that can lead to a lot of problems later. Um, when you see a 1099 that you get uh, from somebody to say that, that you earned, um, you know, $1,000 or something like that, that doesn't automatically mean that you're going to pay tax on all that, uh, that $1,000. So I thought that what would be kind of important today is to just say, you know, what are some of the things that as a musician are common um, as a write-off so you can try to reduce your taxable income as much as possible. Um, and I'm just going to kind of flip around through this list a little bit. It's, it's certainly not comprehensive. It's things that are common and things that, are, um, that we see frequently, but sometimes you may not have thought about. So instruments, computers, gear, music supplies, those, those are all obviously business expenses to a musician, studio and rehearsal fees, the people that are working for you, whether it's your professional team or, or your musicians or, or um, you know, your taxi driver. Uh, you know, people who, the, the taxi driver, the Ubers to get you to a gig, that's, uh, that, that's deductible. Um, travel, hotels, airfare, if you're having a meal and talking to someone about business and about, about a business idea, that's a deductible expense, 50% deductible. Um, you know, research could be all the music that you're purchasing, so you're, so you're trying to figure out, you know, who's you know, who's out there doing something that's exciting and, and interesting in your field. So it could be music purchases, it could be books, it could be publications, anything like that. Um, it could, it, your, your internet connection, typically I would, I, I, I would caution you to, to write off all of it, but I would say a portion of it is, is, is a fair deduction. Uh, your telephone bills, a portion of that is a fair deduction. Um, union dues, subscriptions, et cetera. So, those are just kind of some ideas. I mean, like I said, it's really anything that you, it helps you run your business and helps you make a business out of what you're trying to do. So that $1,000, 1099 that you have that's taxable might turn into $100 after that. So keep, keep that in mind and, and don't let that 1099 scare you about and, and make you not file a tax return. Um, One of the important things is, you know, <laughs> making sure that uh, you have you're set up in a way to really distinguish between your, your, your business expenses and your personal expenses. Um, obviously, the, the easiest way to operate as a business uh, would be just a, a sole proprietorship, right? Because you can walk out the door today and go start business and you are a sole proprietor. You don't have to file anything with the state. You don't have to do anything. Uh, the, the equivalent of that with two people would be a general partnership. You get together with a, you know, your, your bandmate and you all go out and start doing that. You're a general partnership. You don't have to file anything with the state. But most people have gotten, I think, to the point where we understand, you know, it's probably a good idea to create a, a separate entity, right, apart from me as a person. So we create, you know, generally I create LLCs for my client. There's no reason why you, you couldn't do a corporation. Um, there are more corporate formalities that you have to follow when you form a corporation. So I, I generally go with an LLC. You would get a tax ID number specifically for that, uh, that LLC. Uh, go open up a business bank account using that tax ID number and then run your expenses through there. Also run your income through there so that when it does come tax time, make life easy. I mean, if you're self-preparing your taxes, make, e make it easy for you. And if you have a, a CPA or a business manager that's doing it, make it easy on them. Um, and so there are, uh, uh, if you're doing it yourself, you should look into things like QuickBooks. Uh, make sure that you're you're operating like a business, uh, and it'll it really will make life easier on you if you can keep your business expenses separated from your personal expenses. And the easiest way to do that is to have a separate business bank account. 
By the way, even if you are a sole proprietor, you don't want to pay the fees um, to, to set up and maintain an LLC. You can still get your, a separate tax ID number. Right? So when you get your tax ID number, you would just say, well, this is for banking purposes or started a new business. You can get it online, and it's very simple to do to obtain a tax ID number. And so even if you're operating as a, a sole proprietor, you should still go out and get a separate tax ID so that you can go open up a business bank account under that tax ID um, and, and then start deducting, running all these expenses and income through that account. I have to try to figure it out at the end of the year and, right. and put a puzzle together that could have already just been in one place. A yeah. <clears throat> um, couple other things on your tax return that, that may, help, may help reduce your tax bill. Uh, home ownership, mortgage interest, and property taxes. Probably, it's probably a little harder now that with the new tax law because the standard deduction has gone up. I think a lot of less people will be itemizing than, than used to, um, but, it's, but, but it's definitely a potential item that could help. Health insurance, especially if you have your own business, self-employed health insurance is definitely a deduction. Um, and if you're a musician who's performing in other countries, Canada or, or England or anywhere else, they're typically going to be withholding some taxes from you that's a direct credit against the tax that you pay here in the U.S. So, another thing to keep keep track of and make sure that you're you're tracking if you're if you're at that level. And then, last of all, I think you know just a general idea. Even though, like I said, that thousand dollar ten ninety nine might turn into two hundred dollars, you're still going to probably pay some tax. So, put put some tax aside, um, and so when you file your return, you you don't have a big surprise. And what I usually encourage my clients to do is is um, make estimated tax payments. And I think that's uh, what Patrick is, is saying. When put some, the, the easiest way to put the money aside is to get it out of your hands. I, you know, a lot of times people set up tax savings accounts where they will have a specific bank account where they, they put money, you know, they set money aside. For me personally and for a lot of people I know, if I still have access to that money, uh, it tends to find trickle its way back into my operating account, into you know, uh, just unexpected expenses come up, and I just I, I have a hard time just keeping my hands out of that cookie jar. And so, what I do personally, and again, what I encourage you all to do is, you know, you're supposed to make estimated quarterly payments of your taxes. I actually make monthly payments uh, on estimated tax on the estimated taxes that I'm going to owe. And I encourage my clients to do it the same way. It's super simple to do. You can, again, do it online through the IRS's website, set up an account, and all you do is you say, I'm paying this money. It'll draw it directly out of your business bank account or, or, or your bank account. And, uh, and you just say, I'm making an estimated tax payment. And it really, really helps. Uh, the worst thing is to get a, a, you know, a tax bill at the end of the year. Um, uh, that that is a result of not withholding enough, and that's a thing. You know, if you're an employee, if you're an employee, your employer takes care of all that for you. You know, and but when you're getting 1099, that burden is on you. You got to realize that, as Patrick said, that thousand dollars. That's not all. Think about if if you were employed and you were getting a thousand dollars, they'd be taking out Social Security, they'd be taking out Medicare, and they'd be taking out federal income tax, maybe state income tax. All those things need to come out, and that's the sort of stuff that is really good to set aside, um, it, at, at least on a quarterly basis, but I would encourage you to do it on a monthly basis. Do you want to talk about, sorry, do you want to talk about uh, safe harbor rates and making sure people pay enough each year in there? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I, typically I think um, when, when you file your return at the end of one year, you'll get something, or depending on how you do it, but typically you should look at what you paid that prior year, and you can usually base your estimates, your quarterly estimates, on your prior year's tax bill. Now, you don't have to pay that much if, for instance, you're making a lot less money the next year. You can base it on your, current year, your estimated current year tax bill, but, but, uh, but Safe Harbor is basically paying at least as much as, as what last year's bill was or this year's bill, or, or what you expect this year's bill to be. There's, there's nothing worse than getting both a, a, an unexpected tax bill and a penalty because you didn't pay enough in withholding, which I can tell you from experience is annoying and impo impoverishing. Um, so uh, 
The, the last thing to talk about is some minutia about how to manage your personal finances. We, you know, we've heard Tim talk about the difficulty of, of uh, increasing your revenue stream. We heard Patrick talk about some of the expenses that are incurred when you are a musician. And so I, I came up with a list of uh, um, sort of rules of thumb about how to reduce your expenses, of, you know, your day-to-day living expenses. Um, with the help of some personal, uh, personal experience and also some financial advisors. Uh, one is pay your bills on time. You know, and I know it, 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 everyone has the best of intentions, and, and you got into this business to make music, not to, uh, to, to uh, do record keeping and Excel spreadsheets and whatnot. But if you pay your bills on time, that's a significant uh, savings at the end of the month in expense and interest. Um, Shop for checking accounts with no fees. And I know this is tough because the banks after the financial crisis raised the requirement, the, the, the uh, financial requirement to not pay fees. But there, I do know that there are new um, banking entities that offer checking accounts and cash cards with no fees. And these, you know, you have the potential to save uh, up to a couple hundred dollars a month if, you, if your uh, levels fall below certain um, balance requirement. Uh, some of the people that I work with use Venmo. Venmo now has a, a debit card, or Cash Me has a debit card that you can uh, you, you know, get free access to ATMs. You don't have to pay a fee for an ATM, or it's at least a lower ATM fee. I think even some savings and loans have free bank accounts. And so you know, you're, you're saving a $35 a month plus $35 every time you make a transaction. It adds up in a hurry. A lot of streams that pay a $35 a month ATM fee. Watch out for all those other bank fees, right? NSF, ATM fees, uh, low balance. We talked about some of those. Um, I always tell uh, people who ask me, don't use a debit card. Use a credit card, especially if you can pay off the credit card balance at the end of the month. Two things happen. One, the bank owes you for fraud if you use a credit card. They don't owe you anything if someone gets your debit card number. Right? So you're not covered on a debit card. On a credit card, you're covered. The other thing is the debit card money comes out of your, your account today. If you pay your credit card bill at the end of the month, you get a 30-day float. And that could be very helpful if, you, if your balances are low. You get 30 days to put more money in before you have to pay the credit card fee. So I tell people, especially early days when expenses are running high and revenue is uncertain, Use your credit card, especially if you can manage to pay off the balance every month. Um, uh, credit card, you know, credit card purchases of your gear might give you insurance coverage, right? So if you go go to San Francisco in a van and someone breaks the windows and takes your gear out and you have to go replace the gear, uh, or even in Broadmoor, if someone breaks the windows out of your van and takes your gear, then you can sometimes, if you've purchased it on a credit card, if you have the right credit card you can uh, go to them and they will pay at least some of the replacement costs, depending on the credit card agreement that you have. And that's, you know, pretty significant savings because it lowers your insurance, um, you know, the cost of your insurance. Um, if you, the, the other advantage of having a credit card, especially if you keep the balance low and you pay it off every month, is it will help you to build your credit. And so when time comes to go to a uh, a money supplier, a bank, or, or something, if you want to get a loan or if you want to get an investment, if having a good credit rate, uh, rating will help you there, will keep your interest rate lower. The better your credit rating is, the lower your interest rates are, the lower your expenses. Um, sometimes paying a little more, you know, so a lot of my friends who are musicians will oftentimes try and find the cheapest possible deal, right? The best deal on a car or the best deal on gear ends up costing them more later, right? The most expensive car you can buy is a $500 car because you have gotta spend $1,000 next week just to make the thing run again. Um, so, some t- so, so think about, uh, don't always think about the total dollar outlay. Think about the value of the dollars you're spending and how to get the most leverage of the dollars you're spending. Um, and finally, be careful about making extra payments on your car payment or your credit card payment. Pay the balance, but if you make an extra payment, it may not help, right? There may be a there may be a, a early payment penalty, or you know some people will say, "Gee, I made an extra fifty dollar payment every month, and I want to skip a payment." 
doesn't doesn't count. If you skip a payment, even if you've made extra payments all the time, skipping the payment still triggers a big interest rate jump and could could uh, 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 could get you into an endless. Once you start paying, once you go over the date, you start occurring interest every month. It just builds and builds, and you end up paying interest on your interest. So that. So let me stop and see any. Do you guys have any comments? That is our prepared material. Remember the, 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 the intent of the seminar. Look, we know you, you get into this business to create music, not to do bookkeeping. But without the bookkeeping, you're going to lose the ability to make the music. And so we're trying to give you tools that will help you uh, to continue to make your music. And so um, if there are any questions, we'll, we'll entertain them. Otherwise, thank you. Uh, walk up to the microphone to ask your questions. That'd be great. All right. How you guys doing? All right. Good, thank you. All right. Cool. Um, so uh, my question is about publishing. All right. I'm still, I talk to a few people and I, I still don't get it. Some artists say it's best to get your own publishing company. Um, and then other artists I talk to say, well, if you put your music, you know, online through a streaming service, like, uh, distro kid tune core or something like that they're like that is your publisher so what you what do you suggest on the best way to you know keep most of your your money coming to you uh with this this publishing thing i mean what you, you know what what should an independent artist do as far as that goes right well um what i would say is that that until you have like a third party music publisher, you, you do need to be acting as your own publisher. You don't really have a choice, right? So until you contract with, um, uh, you know, Universal Music Publishing or Sony ATV Music Publishing, you are your own publisher and you should act accordingly. So it's your responsibility to go and make sure everything is registered with ASCAP, BMI, uh, and make sure that you have all, if you're co-writing with people, making sure that all those split agreements, all, all the things that a publisher might do, you're responsible for doing that. Uh, I, I, when you say, is it, should you hold on to your publishing? Like it, when it gets to the, that sort of presumes that some third party out there is, is um, looking to administer your publishing. And there are things like uh, TuneCore and DistroKid are, have started to do some offering of publishing administration. And when I look at those uh, particular offerings, uh, my question is, well, you know, what are you giving up what, in terms of revenue? And what are you getting in exchange for that? Um, and when you talk about a publisher like Universal or, or uh, Cobalt or, or Sony ATV, they're going to be taking your songs and working them and growing the revenue pie. That's their job. So it's only fitting that they would participate in the revenue. When you, when you are looking at, at something less than that, um, something like a, uh, an administrative deal like a distro kid may offer, I, I think you just have to ask yourself, you know, what are the services that they're going to provide and is that worth the revenue that I'm, that I'm giving up? Um, but my, I would encourage you to, to keep, it in, keep it in house until it, it, there comes a point where somebody comes along and makes you an offer that you can't refuse. That's that's what I would what I would say. Right. So, I mean, you do you go through a certain company to I mean, like who will, will you go to like get the actual. I mean, well, to get a I to get a publishing deal, yeah. you, your your songs have got to be generating revenue. Oh, right? okay. I mean, that's all right. So it's once thing, you I mean, if you box. signed a record deal, right, like let's say you got a major label deal. Well, somebody would take notice of that and say, hey, I think those those songs that he records are about to start making money right. and they might come make you an offer. Oh, okay. Right, but right. In, until your songs are generating, uh, you know, significant revenue, or somebody sees the potential for significant revenue, nobody's going to offer you a, right. a, a deal. So I think it's best for you to focus on the things that you can control, right. which is making sure that you, as so long as you're self-administering your publishing, you're self-publishing, that you are doing all the things that are necessary that 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 third-party publisher might do. And again, that's making sure that you have split agreements with your mm -hmm. co-writers registering your songs with PROs and, and that sort of thing. Yep. Cool. Thanks.
So I wanted to connect two things. <clears throat> there was a, one of the opening slides that you had was kind of showing um, some different areas where revenue is coming in, coming in and where the expenses are going out. Um, and I am wondering, basically, I, and I haven't looked into QuickBooks. I'm kind of on the edge there. Um, but I do have an Excel sheet. I'm, I guess I'm, the question is, would you recommend a format, like a starter's format, that could kind of have everything in one place? Um, or um, is there a way to kind of segment the way that you would organize your spreadsheets? Um, basically, I have one sheet that's kind of like looking at the different gigs that we're doing as a band um, and just to track how much we're making there. And then, you know, that's all that sheet is being used for. And maybe in another place, I would kind of um, be tallying up the merch, you know, but they're all kind of these separate things. So I'm wondering, is QuickBooks kind of like one of these tools that centralizes all of your, you know, kind of revenue and expenses or is there, yeah. Um, yeah, QuickBooks does a great job at that. Uh, I would say number one, I think you're doing a good job already by separating the touring income from the merchandise income, from the recorded income mm -hmm. and the publishing income. I mean, those are the, the basics, the building blocks. And I think to be able to see what each of those parts of your business are doing and how much they're each making and be able to analyze them separately is worthwhile. QuickBooks can do that both within the accounts that you set up and you can also do classes with QuickBooks. So if you want to see how a tour did, you can, you can set a class coding for all, everything related to a particular tour mm. and you can get as, as detailed as you want really mm. with classes and projects within QuickBooks. So, QuickBooks is a great tool for that. Uh, it sounds like you're off to a good start. Um, <laughs> let me just add that the, the best bookkeeping system is a system that you use every day. So if, if it's going to take you six months to figure out QuickBooks, Excel's fine. Microsoft Word's fine. A, a bag of receipts is fine as long as you have it and can, and can, can get to it and understand what it's telling you. Mm -hmm. yeah, follow but I think it's going to be worthwhile for you to know what each piece of your business, how they're each performing and how you can make them both, make them all better. Yeah, I'm worth it. Um, so the other question is less related to accounting and finances, but more about uh, the conversation that you guys were mentioning regarding radio and that uh, college radio and kind of indie radio doesn't get you as much as commercial radio, right? <clears throat> I guess I'm wondering, because when I did a publicity campaign, I was like, yes, college radio, go for it. That's like, you know, grassroots, that's the, that's the way to go. Um, but I guess I'm wondering now, is there any kind of transfer that happens between college radio and commercial radio? Or are you basically going for one versus the other? Like, do college radio people pass on material and you graduate to commercial radio? Or should you, if you want to be on commercial radio, you just target it and forget about college? Uh, I think if you if you try and target the, the 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 formats that pay the most money, no amount of targeting from an indie artist is going to get you on those formats. It's a waste of money, right? Because their playlists are so heavily controlled. I mean, you know, the the radio uh, the the consolidation in the radio industry is is just crazy out of control, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, the the play the amount of songs and the the discretion that those DJs have to play uh, independent music is, is next to none in most instances. Uh, the reason why a, a, a targeting campaign to college radio and to non-com radio is wor you know, potentially worthwhile is that it can actually have some results. Mm. And so when you, do, when you have a campaign where, that's targeting non-com stations and college radio, you're not doing that to generate public performance revenue. You're doing that to generate attention and to try and, and, and grow the, the number of people that are listening to you and your exposure. But that's the real return there is the exposure uh, uh, to new listeners and, and generally in a market where you're hopefully going to tour mm -hmm. and you're trying to get people out to your show and, and then buy your merchandise, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the investment that you're making. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, getting, you know, independent music on um, on popular commercial radio, uh, that is, you know, a really really tough nut to crack. Yeah. 
and uh, you know even famously independent artists like you know uh, Macklemore and and um, you know Chance they uh, they actually in some cases have employed major label um, radio departments because they ha- those major labels uh, still have the relationships with commercial radio in order to get their their songs onto mm. onto those playlists. So I don't want to I don't want to say to to be too cynical about it and that you know there can never be a groundswell for, of of popularity from you know from the ground up and get you onto commercial radio but I am going to be cynical about it and say that in you know almost every instance that's not going to happen and your money is better spent targeting places who actually have discretion over what they play and that would be non-common in college radio. Mm. Thank you. Also uh satellite radio, right? I I would really focus on satellite radio because you can actually make some money on, on satellite radio. So don't forget about when you're targeting those things, don't forget about satellite radio. Uh, it's, you know, there's only really one provider, but they've got a lot of channels and they do have discretion. Those, those DJs do have discretion over uh, what they play in many instances. So, um, you know, don't, don't ignore that either. So I just wanted to talk about the uh, licensing side of things, right? So for a long time, I struggled with like, oh, you know, I can go with Rocket Fish or I can use this, whoever other, you know, uh, licensing company. But you ultimately just have your music sitting there hoping for the best. And it's kind of just like a, a word to all of y'all to like maybe employ this tactic because I found out I actually got a lot more back from this is I was like, OK, let me take a song, figure out what that song is kind of about and what product perhaps can I pair that with? Like we had a song that talked a lot about drinking wine. So what I did was I started reaching out to wine company, like marketing departments, like, hey, check out this song. You know, like, I think it would go well with your product. It's about this, that, and the other. And I got so many responses back about that kind of stuff than, like, trying to use a service, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, look, those, those, play, those libraries, I mean, th- th- there sure. are more music libraries out there now than there ever have been before and, and where, you know, you, you can get... Um, uh, your music into their library and advertisers and, 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 and music supervisors go and use those services to try and find music, sure. but you're right. I mean, it's in some instances, you're a needle in a haystack exactly. and it's hard to, so I was know, trying to figure out, you know, how can I backdoor this whole thing and, yeah. and make it and, work for me, you know? And look, as long as the, the risk is low, I mean, I don't necessarily see a reason not to do it. I mean, it's, as long as um, it's not inhibiting other opportunities that you may have, um, but, you know, that's, that's a really uh, interesting and innovative approach that, that you've taken. And, and, and oddly enough, I just ended up doing a, a pretty lucrative deal for a local artist this week uh, with a, a coffee company exactly. for, for a song yeah, about sure. coffee. Right. And they're using it as, as a part of their ad campaign on radio. Um, and that's, a, you know, look, essentially, I don't want to, I say this not in a, a derisive way, but, you know, you can write jingles. <laughs> Yeah, you sure, know, totally, I mean, exactly. if you're a songwriter, you can write about whatever, you know, that's yeah. your talent is writing songs. And to the extent that you can generate revenue writing for uh, writing for advertisements or writing for particular uh, outlets that you have in mind, uh, I say yeah. go for it, man. Uh, you're yeah, still I mean, doing think, what you love. Is, yeah, I and think that's the making music. I got was, you know, like, you know, make it happen for yourself and don't rely on some company that's out there just resting with your music in their library. No. I mean, if you can develop, I mean, look, uh, Scott and, and, and Reed Wick, the Recording Academy, they have different uh, panels, you know, where they bring in music supervisors. And if sure. you can make those relationships with music supervisors, maybe that's, a, you know, a way to become a, a larger needle in the yeah, sure. smaller haystack. And so January 23rd is okay. the next. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. I feel like I'm just going to say the elephant that's in the room. I'm an independent artist, right? Um, That first slide is exactly what my my brain is saying, like all these things. How do I get this done, right? So I'm emerging, and I'm no longer independent. I've got a manager. I've got a booking agency. I've got a publicist. And... But I don't have a business manager yet, not quite ready to start splitting that pie up anymore. But it's once you go from the, we're doing these gigs, I got my little spreadsheet with how much everybody's going to get paid, and now you're paying all these people. And now I'm not even the person booking the gig. 
and I don't even know what the bottom line is. Like, I, you, when you, once you've given all this control away of your business, how do I navigate this world of, but where's, this, where's my money? And how much am I going to have at the end of the month? And how do I coordinate all this? Or how do I even know? How do I keep, like, I have to let you, I really need to know by the 15th how much money I'm going to have. And there's sometimes no clear answer because the plane tickets haven't been bought or the commission, like, so there's this, I'm just on this, like, teeter-tottering right now. And I'm just trying to figure out, how to navigate these next like maybe six or eight months of being my own business manager, maybe having an assistant that does this coordination between the agency and, and, and plotting out the gigs and bottom lining each tour of, you know, I feel like I just want somebody to sit down with me and tell me what you do right now until I can hire you because I feel like that's what we want. And like, how do we, not to feel like we can't pay our bills and save when the slide you showed us before, 45% of what we used to bring home is now going to other people. So that transition like happens overnight. How do you navigate that? Um, I'll take some of that question and maybe you can talk a little bit about it too. Um, I mean, one of the most important things and the most things, the things that we spend the most time dealing with for our clients is cash flow forecast is looking yeah. at how much is in the bank right now. What are the next six or eight months look like from a revenue perspective? Can I estimate what my tour revenue is going to be, what my recorded royalties are going to be and what, what that's going to be? What are my fixed costs? What do I have to pay every month? What do I need to take home every month in order to, to pay my bills? Um, and, and we just put it into a format where we, we look at it over the next six, eight, or 12 months and make sure that it's going to, you know, to the best of our ability, because you, no one's perfect about right. forecasting, is it going to work? Or do I need to make some changes? Do I need to cut some expenses here? Can I afford to pay my publicist uh, in these months? You know, maybe when the record's not, just been released or something mm -hmm. like that. I mean, that's, that's one of the most important services that we provide to our artists because most of our artists are in a similar position. I think. Um, the other part of the thing and part of that slide that we kind of glossed over a little bit is the people that you hire do need to kind of pay for themselves. You know, it's, it's, and that's always a judgment call. There's never necessarily a perfect formula that says, is this person paying for themselves or not? Um, your bank, your bank balance is probably the best, is probably the best indication of that. Um, any thoughts? I mean, I would say that there are some people on, some of those team members, um, the, the way that they earn their keep is by growing the pie. You know, we've talked about, you know, that I think with an, another person, it was, if, if you're going to go with a, a music publisher, if you're going to go with a record label, uh, if you're going to go with a manager, um, a, an agent, right? They're, the way that they earn their keep is by growing the pie. And so if they're not, if their services are not, uh, that's how they pay for themselves. Because yes, the manager is now taking 15 or 20%, but the pie's larger. And so ultimately you're taking home more, right? Than you were when you were keeping 100% of the revenue. Then you have other types of professional services where, you know, legal and financial are more about peace of mind, right? And that we're not necessarily in the business of, of, of growing the pie. At least that's not the primary thing that I do. But when you talk about the uncertainties that you're looking at, and I think you have to ask yourself, you know, is that worth 5% of your revenue to, I mean, and in you most cases. You told me not to seek you out. You told me to wait until you came to me. So I'm like, okay, I'm just well, going to and be well, like nervous well, for the next six months. <laughs> my referrals come from attorneys or, attorneys or managers. managers, honestly. Yeah. Or yeah. other artists who say, I've got a great business manager. You should talk to this guy. Yeah. That's, that's most of what my business comes from. Yeah. I, and like I said, that, when I mentioned that, I think business managers are, are a little bit different. But, I, you know, we get a lot of referrals. Uh, I mean, I get a lot of referrals for clients through artist managers and whatnot as well. So, um, you know, when your revenue gets to the point where you st you're particularly when you're starting to pay people on a regular basis and, um, you know, there are uh, uh, just 
a lot of nitty gritty things that need to go on with that in terms of you know issuing w you know issuing and receiving back w nines and issuing ten ninety nines at the end of the year and all this other stuff, and that's things that a that a CPA can assist you with. And when you get to the point where um, your revenue, uh, you know, can attract a business manager, um, and I don't you know don't know what your revenues are, and I don't think we will talk about it now, but at a certain point your revenues get to the, uh, you know, uh, get large enough to where we'll take you on at 5%, right? And because that starts to seem very fair to us, where 5% of what you're making seems like a fair return for our time, right? And uh, when you get to that point, I would urge you to run, not walk, to somebody like Patrick and, uh, and, and, and employ them, you know, for the, that purpose, because we really are in the business of peace of mind and making sure that you stay out of trouble. And I, I, for and the most part, I think, um, you know, paying uh, 5% for that kind of peace of mind is, is well worth it. So, so, Patrick, what you do, you, so would you say you coordinate with like a booking agency to see like forecasted gigs and things to make that? 100%. Okay. Uh-huh. With your manager and your agent on the touring side with your manager, maybe your attorney on the other side. I mean, we usually we have historical figures that we can base projections on. Um, but I, I think part of our role sometimes also can be answering the question that you're asking. Is, mm -hmm. is this person pulling their weight? Is my manager pulling their weight? Is my agent the right person? Should I be paying a publicist? I mean, that has to be right. my Cause, role sometimes. Because like, you know, I'm, I'm having a personal conversation here. Thank you so much. That was great. great. <laughs> um, I was intrigued when we started talking about the Music Modernization Act, so it seems like you're well-versed in, in the new uh, law. What about that act is something that we should know about now before it happens? Or what things in that act are things that could benefit our businesses or how we'll be doing future, uh, doing business in the future as it relates to the new law? Uh, well, there is a, there's a lot in the Music Modernization Act that, that uh, I think one of the, the, the biggest changes that I hope to see is one that I've already mentioned earlier, and that's an increase in the mechanical royalty rate for streaming. As you can see, it is just beyond low. Um, when you look at getting 9.1 cents per digital download versus you know, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a penny for every stream, um, it, that is just not sustainable for us as a music community. We, we cannot build careers on fractions of a fractions of a penny. And some of the, the changes uh, in the music modern, that the Music Modernization Act um, allows that rate setting body, there's a government body that determines what that rate is going to be. So there's a reason, to re why is it 9.1 cents? Well, there's a government agency out there that said it was gonna be 9.1 cents. Why is it that low for streaming? Well, that, that same body made that decision. And what the Music Modernization Act does is it allows that rate setting body to consider uh, uh, what that transaction would be in an open market as opposed to um, uh, what it's currently set at, which is uh, what's called the 801B factors. And that's getting, I'll talk to you about it afterwards if you want to know more. Um, but that's one of the major changes. I think if you're a, pre uh, a, a sound recording artist that has uh, pre-1972 sound recordings, the fact that you're actually now going to get paid for the d digital public performance of, of those um, sound recordings, that's major. Um, but anything that can, and I, I hate to be pessimistic, but I'm kind of moved on from the Music Modernization Act, and now I want, I want more. So I'm looking at the things that the Music Modernization Act didn't do, and that's what I want now. And what I want now is a public performance right for sound recordings, so when, you're, when your recording gets put on the radio, you get paid just like the songwriter gets paid. And I also want YouTube to have to pay its fair share for streaming your music and not to be able to hide behind uh, you know, a loophole in copyright law to depress the, the rate that they pay. So uh, that's what I want right now. And I would encourage all of you to get involved with the, with the Grammy advocacy folks. Uh, if, if you talk to Reed Wick, who's walking around here, um, he can you know, he, we, he can help you get involved with that and you can actually go meet with your legislators and push for this.
And I promise you, your voice does actually matter. Um, the Music Modernization Act passed f- like with zero uh, dissenting vote. And when's the last time that's ever happened in Congress? And the reason it happened is because uh, the compromised nature of the bill, but also because the music community really stepped up and said, uh, we're going to get involved in politics for a little bit. Uh, we're going to, you know, and that's an important thing to do because a lot of the money that you make depends on policies that are occurring in Washington, D.C., and I don't think uh, most musicians realize that. I, th- I think that's it, then. No more questions? Thank you all. Thank you very much for coming out. <laughs>